Hi there, this is uh, Apes Chapter 10, uh, Lecture Part 2. So now we're going to talk about controlling pests and weeds. Um, basically, pests, anything that does damage to what we're trying to grow. Weeds are usually plants that are out competing or competing with um, the plants that we want, that we're, we're trying to grow. Okay, so these are major problems for farming, basically, in agriculture. So what do we use? Well, the most common thing they're using nowadays are chemicals, pesticides. And pesticides include chemicals that target insects, insecticides, herbs or plants, weeds in this case, herbicides, and fungus. Just so you know, um, there's a fungus right now that is um, impacting bananas worldwide. And it's the, the good news is it doesn't move very fast. The The bad news is the, the worry is it's going to maybe possibly one day wipe out the bananas that we have on our planet. We'll have to probably partake in some genetic modification, something to help uh, help the banana survive. So fungus is commonly a problem. It's not just insects and weeds and plants. So a lot of these chemicals are applied in the United States each year. And one of the most common ones that's applied is the herbicide called um, glyphosate or Roundup. Okay, so glyphosate is Roundup. Atrazine is another common herbicide. So if you see these words anywhere, you know what you're talking about. You're talking about weed killers for the most part. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of insecticides, of fungicides, but these are common ones that you'll see a lot. Um, Monsanto owns the glyphosate, and they're, they're making a lot of money on farmers using their chemical. Okay, A lot of money is made. All right, so what's going on with pesticides and these chemicals? Well, they believe there's definitely health risks associated with these pesticides. Um, after your book was written um, and published, this this particular book, um, there's been a, quite a few lawsuits recently um, targeting uh, Monsanto, specifically uh, glyphosate, and they've lost, actually. So um, there's been some meta-analysis studies done, and the data is showing um, links to glyphosate and cancer okay um and and they they lost these lawsuits which means the courts are saying yeah glyphosate is causing these people's cancer um, there's some huge class actions going on but this is happening and i believe in california um somebody was awarded a a, a huge sum of money as a result of their cancer uh, diagnosis i believe the the person was a custodian at a school and he was um, using uh, Roundup or glyphosate on the weeds that were growing around the school, and he developed a rare cancer, and uh, he won his case. It's sad because uh, who knows if he'll live very long because of the cancer that he developed. So it's a, it's a really sad situation. The farmers are exposed to these. A lot of these chemicals become aerosols, which means they volatize. They become part of the air, and you can inhale them. Um, basically, pesticides also kill things you're not intending them to kill. They might kill predators and parasites and pests, but they're non-target. And you, these are parasites and pests that you need to control certain populations of other organisms. So you're not necessarily um, you're not helping the balance of that environment by using a lot of these chemicals. All right. Um, here's what's going on here too. Like I said, don't forget that we also ingest some of these pesticides when we eat these fruits and vegetables, um, non-organic produce for the most part. Um, it's a good idea to rinse your produce. A lot of these pesticides are water soluble, which means if they're on the surface, you can wash them off for the most part. But if they become part of the in internal parts of your fruits or vegetables, there's not much you can do. So, um, studies have shown though, you, you're, people would, I've had students in the past that said, well, I'm not going to eat fruits and vegetables unless they're organic. That's not very smart. Um, eating fruits and vegetables is proven to be good for your health, whether they are organic or not. Um, we will talk about in another chapter later on which ones are the healthier ones, fruits and vegetables that you need to eat organic or want to eat organic versus the ones that you don't. And we'll talk about that in a later chapter. All right. Neonicotinoids, or yeah, I believe I'm pronouncing it right. These are the chemicals. These are insecticides that are, they believe these are the ones, the family of uh, chemicals that are hurting the bees. All right. Um, these affect basically the, you know, the systems of the plant. These chemicals get into the flowers. They get into the, 
into the stems, into the pollen of the plant, and then they get, um, you know, these insects or these bees land on the on the plant and they pick up the pollen and then they basically get poisoned. All right. So basically, the they believe this is the family of chemicals or insecticides specifically that's doing the most damage to the bees. All right. We pests. What do they do? Well, they evolve resistance. What does that mean? Well, these chemicals we use on them don't always work. Like Roundup doesn't always work. Well, what happens? Let's go back to Darwin. Within a population, you and this is a population in this case of um, these insects. Okay, um, these pests within the population, you will have variation. Some of these insects have uh, genes that protect them from these chemicals. They can detoxify them or they can break them down or metabolize those particular chemicals. So because they can do that, um, there's some within the population that are able to do that because of the genetic variation that naturally is part of the population. So what happens? The ones that the, the, the organisms that are able to survive within the population will live long enough to make babies and they will reproduce. And then over many generations, you now have a population that is, for the most part, it becomes it becomes resistant to these chemicals that would have actually done damage. So how do farmers combat this? A lot of times they just use more and more and more of these chemicals. All right, and I and I will and I'm not going to lie to you if I tell you that when they use this Roundup, this chemical, you know, these pesticides, glyphosate, they use a lot of it. There's a lot of pesticides that are applied to these crops. A method of controlling uh, pests um, would be the would be the uh, using biological control, which means using another predator or something that can you know in some cases you might even a parasite of a particular species you might bring it into an environment and have it uh, get rid of them basically for you, so you don't have to do it yourself. You can do it naturally or without the use of chemicals. All right. So what do you have? Well. Basically, you have, like I said, in this case here, you have before the cactus moth was introduced to the population, all right? So you had all, you had this, these cactuses were everywhere, all right? And they were being invasive in this forest region. So what did they do? They brought in, um, they brought in the cactus moth and it came in and it, and it took out a lot of, and ate a lot of these cactus. So what did it do? It got rid of the cactus. So now the forest, the natural habitat was was able to be replenished and go back to its natural state. All right. BT or Bacillus thuringiensis, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but that's it. BT. What we did what scientists did is they discovered that certain bacteria in the soil make their own protein. So they have a gene that allows them to make their own protein. All right. What does this gene do? Um, basically it it is a natural insecticide it kills insects basically so what did scientists do they said well why don't we take this gene from this bacteria that live in soil and they live in soil and so it's a natural insecticide in soil well scientists figured out why don't we take this gene and insert it genetically modify crops and these crops if we genetically modify them with these genes that they need to produce this protein then now the crops themselves will naturally produce their own insecticide. Okay. And this is what scientists figured out that they can do. Okay. Another method, another method of controlling insects and controlling populations in this case um, of pests would be IPM, integrated pest management. So this means you're doing a bunch of things. You're not doing one thing. You might use some pesticides. You're going to use a biological control method. You might, change habitat in a way you might rotate crops so that you have different crops on the land you might transgenic crops means they're genetically modified crops you might not you might alternate your tilling cycles all right you might use actual physical removal you might go out there and physically remove them um, you may have a problem with rodents you might bring dogs out there to help get rid of these rodents so whatever it is that you're trying to do a combination of those becomes ipm all right. So it's not just using one method. It's using a combination of methods to do this. So what have scientists been doing? Well, they've companies like Monsanto have been genetically engineering um, crops 
all right? And we're going to talk about how they genetically engineered them in a second. So what do they generally do? They can modify DNA. They can insert a gene into, into another section of DNA. Okay, so this is a bacteria. This is modified. This is a recombinant DNA in bacteria. And what they're showing you is they're showing you this bacterial DNA, right? And they have this thing called the plasma, which is circular. They can cut out DNA that they want, like a gene that they want, all right? And then they can insert that gene. And now that gene goes back into the bacteria. And now the bacteria, as they divide and reproduce, they will produce that gene product. So let's just say... Uh, Basically, in this case, you can you can you can base the, the common one we used in biology. Is we talked about how bacteria can make, for example, human insulin. We took a human insulin gene and put it into bacteria. We have bacteria factories that are making insulin. But we could do this with with just about any protein product that we want to create. Okay, so Roundup Ready soybeans. Well, they transferred a gene from that bacteria from a bacteria. Okay, and that gene from that bacteria. Is it makes the it makes these particular plants resistant to Roundup, so they can make plants, for example, soybeans that are resistant to Roundup. What did they do to the soybeans? They inserted a gene from a bacteria that allow that makes them um, makes them not susceptible to those chemicals, basically. All right, in terms. Genetically modified organisms or genetically modified foods that are used commonly together. Genetic engineering is the manipulating of DNA in order to create things like recombinant DNA. All right? The U.S. leads the way when it comes to this kind of stuff. We are really, really heavily involved in it. Okay? Um, basically, genetically modified ingredients are in a lot of food in your grocery store. Almost everything that is packaged, okay? So I would say foods that are not, you know, not, not necessarily your produce section, all right? Fruits and vegetables. I'm talking everything that's processed and packaged most likely has genetically modified corn or soy or a byproduct of corn or soy in it, all right? A lot of it. A lot of the sugar in our country comes from high fructose corn syrup. So almost everything in our country that has sugar in it, in the United States, that sugar came from corn that was genetically modified. Here are examples of different kinds of genetically modified foods. Golden rice, this is a big one. Why is it a big one? Well, they said, why don't we modify the rice to produce beta carotene, which is vitamin A. So now rice, which naturally didn't produce vitamin A, is now going to produce vitamin A, and it can help people in these countries where they're having vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A deficiency leads to blindness. There was a gentleman in England uh, a few years ago, I read this article. Gentleman in England, a young guy, I think he was not even 20, maybe 19 or 20, he went blind. Okay, lost vision. Apparently, all he ate in his diet, and don't ask me exactly how he did it, all he would eat were potatoes. He would not eat anything else. He didn't eat meat. He didn't eat any other plant. All he ate were potatoes. In England, I, just so you know, I believe they eat a lot of French fries. They call them chips there. So I believe he ate a lot of French fries or chips, and that was his daily diet. Early in his life, I want to say late teens, he went blind as a result of vitamin A deficiency. So golden rice is rice that produces vitamin A. Um, hopefully down the road, and I wouldn't be surprised, they're probably going to genetically modify bananas to be resistant to the fungus I mentioned to you. Right now we have papayas that are virus, viral resistant. Um, the virus is called the ring spot virus. And basically they started growing them in Hawaii in 2001, and they're, they're being shipped all over the world basically. BT cotton. Now BT is Bacillus thuringiensis. That is the bacteria that makes its own insecticide. So they took that gene for insecticide production and put it in the cotton. Now when this cotton grows, it produces its own insecticide. Okay? So they, it's, it's a good thing in that they don't have to use as much insecticide because it is producing its own. All right? That's a good thing. Roundup Ready alfalfa means these plants, this alfalfa, it is resistant to glyphosate or resistant to Roundup. So what you do is when you grow the Roundup, you literally hose and spray down the entire harvest everywhere with glyphosate or Roundup. And basically, you end up killing all the weeds, and the survivor ends up being the alfalfa. 
So Roundup Ready crops are using a lot of Roundup, not a little, a lot, all right? Genetically uh, modified salmon. We talked about this salmon. It's going to be the farm salmon. Um, grows quick, fast. It's been approved. We have laws in our country where they don't have to tell you that you're eating genetically modified salmon, but we'll talk about that later in this lecture. Biotech potatoes, potatoes that are resistant to uh, the blight that uh, and a pathogen that, that killed a lot of the potatoes back in the 1800s. So they don't want to lose the they don't want to lose their crops. So they've developed them to be resistant to it. BT corn. This is corn that also with Bacillus thuringiensis produces its own insecticide. I have heard that corn fields that are BT corn fields. I have heard that you should wear a hazmat outfit when you walk through a BT cornfield. The corn is genetically modified. There's so much of it growing as a monoculture. Apparently, there's so much of this of this protein, uh, natural insecticide that is produced that there's a potential of it being hazardous to humans that may be working there. So in some cases, they're saying that the corn itself can be classified as an insecticide because it produces that much of it in one place. So BT corn, they're producing it to make its own insecticide. All right. And by the way, this stuff ends up in all of the processed foods that you eat. All right. Roundup ready sugar beets, beets that are resistant to glyphosate. Biotech soybeans. Oh, this is soybeans are the most grown genetically modified product out there. They have BT soybeans. They have Roundup ready soybeans. They have soybeans of all sorts that have been genetically modified. Um, sunflowers and super weeds. What they've realized is they've made some BT sunflowers, and then they realized, wait a minute, they can mate with the wild species. And then they were worried that they would create wild species of super weeds. Remember, plants can cross. Um, pollinate each other. So it doesn't necessarily have to be another exact match of sunflower for it to pollinate with. So you, the worry is we're creating plants that are, in some cases, making their own insecticides. And if they become weeds, they'll become super weeds that are now make these weeds will be making their own insecticides. So it'll be a problem for us to deal with them later. All right. Showing you genetically modified crops. Look at the soybeans leads the way. Canola, we may call it vegetable oil. Okay, corn's up there. We we put this in almost all of the processed foods, sugar, corn syrup. This be, feeds the cows and the chickens and everything that we eat. A lot of it is genetically modified. Um, who leads the way in all this stuff? The U.S., of course. All right. So what are the benefits of GM crops? Well, there are benefits of genetically modified crops. Um, first off, you um, what you have here is you have more food security, okay? You have more food security, but just so you know, and it's important, most crops that have been genetically modified, this is an important one, they have been genetically modified for two things, most crops. They are either tolerant, herbicide tolerant, which means Roundup ready or resistant to glyphosate, that's the most common, or the next most common, the two most common, this one would be BT crops, which make their own insecticide. So BT crops and Roundup Ready crops are the most commonly genetically engineered crops that we have. You can engineer crops to last longer, to ripen slower and do different things. But the most common reason for genetically modifying crops today, resistance, making their own BT crops, making their own chemical pest, their own pesticides, insecticides, and being resistant to herbicides, okay? So once again, what are the positives? Well, more food, grow more food. Um, if you do this, you may not need to clear as much land. You might be able to do it with less space. That's the goal, all right? So alleviate pressure, clear forest. If you genetically modify them in a certain way, maybe it can conserve water, okay? We talked about the golden rice, make them healthier. And the big one here, re reduction in, in, the, in pesticide application, but this isn't reduction in, in glyphosate. No, this would be reduction in insecticides for the BT crops, basically, because plants that are genetically modified for glyphosate resistance are using way more applications of pesticide. The ones that are reducing it are the BT crops. Meta-analysis. This is where you do a giant study and you look at studies all over the place and then you statistically analyze those studies. These are huge studies and they're generally really good uh, 
studies to use to to extrapolate data and ideas. Um, what some meta analysis have shown recently is that is that organic fruits, organic excuse me, farming has higher yields over long term windows of time. And why is that the case? That's because organic farming on a long term basis, um, there's a the, the genetic diversity in the organic farm enables them to withstand changes, environmental changes, and over time the yields. Are not, are not bad. When you look at the yields of monocultures, they're huge, but if they have a bad year, it's a very bad year for them. Okay. So if the environment, they have a weird weather year, it'll, it'll affect their entire crop. Right. So, so here's what this is saying. Um, herbicides, like I said earlier, Monsanto, their glyphosate, it's increasing the decrease in pesticides would be specifically these, those insecticides um, that are the BT crops. All right. What are the risks? Well, the risks aren't heavily known yet. A lot of people are, are saying that one of the biggest problems is that GMOs could breed with wild species and then it could mess with um, selection, natural selection, and it then can over time reduce biodiversity. Hopefully, hopefully it does do that, but that's the worry. They're also worried about a big one that people need to be worried about is genetically modified food means it's producing a different protein product. You could have allergic reactions to genetically modified foods where you may not have had an allergic reaction to the, to the original or native species that wasn't genetically modified. There is not a lot known today about the risks other than the fact that our food is being, is evolving much faster than humans. Um, digestive systems are evolving. We're, we're creating food and different types of foods so rapidly we have not necessarily evolved with our food. Our food evolved with us for a long time, and now it's no longer doing that because we're creating it at a much more rapid rate, basically. What's the debate over GMO, GMOs? Well, the big problem is, is people um, need food for survival. GMOs are probably helping us feed the world right now. Um, the big problem that you may notice is these huge companies. I've already talked about Monsanto. I believe Bayer owns Monsanto. You hear of Dow, DuPont. All these big companies, they're chemical, they produce chemicals. And these chemicals um, aren't necessarily good for us. There's concerns about what they're putting out there, right? Um, and like I told you earlier, like farmers' crops being pollinated by neighbors' GM crops, they're sued. Okay, they're sued by these big corporations. It's just sad what they have done to these farmers. Um, and I think that will end our lecture. Oh, we're almost there. Labeling of genetic man manufactured foods. I mentioned it earlier in the United States, it was on the voting ballots uh, a few year, many years back and the, the food companies didn't want you to vote for it. So they had this huge campaign trying to convince people to not vote for the labeling of genetically modified foods. They wanted just to know that if the food I'm buying has genetically modified ingredients in it, I just want to know that it has it in there. And it was not voted for. The ballot measure was voted down. It was defeated. It shows you that they they kind of trick the consumer. Some consumers don't care. Me personally, I'd want to know if the food I'm eating is genetically modified. I'd want to know if the salmon that I'm eating is genetically modified. You may have an allergic reaction to the modification, so I'd rather know what I'm eating. All right. Organic agriculture. What makes something organic? Well, there's a list. If it's crops or livestock. Okay. For crops, land must be free of chemicals for three years. Cop, the crops, they cannot be genetically modified, okay? Irradiation using lighting or UV to kill bacteria, that's common. That's not allowed. Sewage sludge, not allowed. That would be, you have it start breaking down and decomposing, and hopefully you could use it as some type of fertilizer. I believe that's the goal. Organic seeds and planting stock are preferred, not totally necessary, but they're preferred. Um, synthetic fertilizers are not being used, basically. You're supposed to be used crop rotation and all these other things or organic fertilizers in most cases that are decomposing and breaking down. All right. Most conventional pesticides are prohibited. Keyword most, not all, but most are prohibited. All right. For animals to be organic. All right. They have to be raised organically for the last third of gestation. So the first two thirds of their lifespan in their mama's belly, they don't necessarily have to be organic. Okay. Um, from their second day of life, that has to take place too. The feed has to be organic, okay? Some vitamins and minerals are allowed, but the feed has to be organic. So vitamins and minerals would be supplements. And um, 
those are additives, but they're allowed. All right. 80% of organic feed was dairy cows, nine months followed by three months of a 100% organic feed. So these are just showing you all the things. Hormones and antibiotics are prohibited, which is good when you're getting organic milk, for example. Okay. But they are allowed vaccines. So you are putting some chemicals inside of them. All right. And keyword. Animals have to have access to the outdoors. It doesn't mean they're going to go outdoors. A lot of times it's too hot. Ideally, use your locally grown farmer's markets. The food has a, it has a lower uh, carbon footprint, and that's because it's grown locally. You're not driving it very far. A lot of your food comes from you know another country sometimes, and it has a huge carbon footprint added to it. Okay? And life cycle analysis, basically... What they look for is they're looking at fossil fuels, fuel consumption over the over the life of, of something. And this is what we're talking about. I was talking about, you know, the CO2 emissions produced as a result of production of your food. So we're looking about like how far your food goes and how far it travels. So your food has, you know, is connected to greenhouse gas emissions. All right. Most greenhouse gas emissions, the production of CO2 happen at the farm or at the feedlot, okay, producing the animal products specifically. But there is a amount of it that goes in the actual movement of your food. We'll stop right there.